Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, we are talking about producing unscripted content in an uncertain world. And really, the uncertainty is beyond sort of the pandemic that we're facing, but also how do we walk into a world and tell a story from an unscripted point of view. And this panel is something that Andrew Freed and I sort of conceived to do every year at South by Southwest for the past few years. Andrew Freed is a uh, the founder of Boardwalk, and he produces such amazing shows as Cheer and Chef's Table, and also has a director uh, in Freestyle Love Supreme, which is currently on Hulu. And he and I, every year, try to figure out what we're curious about when it comes to producing unscripted content. And we were hesitant to go forward with an online panel because, quite frankly, our motivations were queso, margaritas, and Sixth Street. But when both Amanda LeBeau and David Collins agreed to graciously join us, we decided that we had to kind of forge through and talk about what is relevant in our world and space right now. So I'm going to bring up Andrew Freed um, virtually. Um, <laughs> Hello, Elsa. I, hi, how are you doing? Good. It's good to see you. Good I, to I'm see sorry you we're not eating queso, but it's Me nice too. to see you. Yeah, that's yeah. usually our pre-panel discussion yeah. to kind of get to get warmed up. Yeah. Um, well, I am really thrilled that you're here. And, and Andrew and I have been working together since the inception of Boardwalk, um, pre-Chef's Table and pre kind of this idea of what a docu-series even is. Um, and I feel like you and I were at the forefront of that, trying to explain to to Netflix what that meant. Um, and now, I don't even know how many seasons and, later. Well, and then trying to explain to other people what Netflix was. It was both right. things. That's, that's um, absolutely true. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a while ago. Yeah, we started production on Chef's Table in 2014, and then it released in 2015. And even when it released in 2015, you know, nobody really knew what Netflix was. Um, yeah. It had a house of cards. We were their first unscripted original. So it's it's been a fun six years for sure. Yeah. Well, joining Andrew and I um, is another sort of pioneer in his own right. David Collins is the co-founder of Scout Productions. And um, not only is the OG Queer Eye, but the new incarnation of Queer Eye, multi Emmy award winning. Um, and also recently at Legendary is another notch in his belt of a great show on the air, this time with HBO Max. So you're kind of playing it up with different, different platforms and spaces. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working with David sort of post OG Queer Eye, but have learned so much from him and his vision and his way to just create universes that we all just binge watched, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, so thanks for joining us, David. Hi, Elsa. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Hey. Um, and finally, the only reason why we get these shows on the air is you need a crude top of the her game agent and Amanda LeBeau is at CAA and somebody that we've shared, I've shared clients with, I, I love. And um, it's a very, it's a rare thing. It's an oxymoron to say I love an agent, but I can honestly say that about Amanda LeBeau because she is not just an advocate and a great salesperson in her own right, but also it just has a, a creative integrity to what she does and who she gravitates around. So it's always fun to, to be alongside you. It's not so fun to be against you, I have to say. It's not, it's fun not to be my against you. Yeah, yeah, it's not not my preference. Um, so look, I, this is meant to be conversational for those of you watching it. I hope you enjoy. Wait, did it. you say David was Emmy winning? Because I wasn't. <laughs> I'm sorry. I wasn't yes. Sure. Yeah. If yeah. Oh, <laughs> this is not a green screen. Oh, this is the reality. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! There's more. I love it. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, well, look, let's first get started with just kind of the the general sort of what gets you out of bed in the morning, right? Like, how do you figure out a concept or a world that you want to develop and put out there and sell and produce? And in, in both of your instances, it's for years to come, right? So like, what is that genesis? What is that look like for you as a process, as an experience, et cetera? And I'll leave it to David or Andrew. Oh, all right. Well, that's a, that's a big question. I know. It is. Um, you know, I'll tell you, it, it's definitely evolved, right, over the years. Uh, I have I, I've had a really blessed and, and, and fortunate career. And one of those stories that I, I haven't told a lot is that um, when I was 20 years old, my very first job was with Jodie Foster. I was her assistant 
on her directorial debut called Little Man Tate. And it was interesting because that moment was definitely a like timing meets being at the right place at the right time. And it just happened. And I got to, I got to honestly, at, at such a young age, witness the creative process through her eyes and, and see this, this from paper uh, uh, across her desk, as I sat at her desk, I watched this film just mesmerize and become this amazing story of Little Man Take. And, and I would say a lot of, a lot of my, even now, uh, current inspiration comes back from then. When, when how she would process, and she was always about surrounding herself with really amazing, creative, cool people who she wasn't the leader of. She was the one just taking it in and listening, and, and she had really impeccable taste. And so I, I like to think that, uh, you know, especially if I consider my Instagram as at style, taste, and class, um, <laughs> that I got to keep something, right, is that I... I, I like to consider myself as, I have good taste. I was lucky enough to have good taste, but I know that it always starts with putting the right people around me. And, and, and so I'm really blessed that, that we have a family at Scout of really smart, creative people who care about the stories they want to tell. Um, and that part is really, that's the cool part of my job is that I get to hang out with some really cool people and talk about some really cool stuff every day. Yeah, if that makes sense. It makes it a lot does. Of sense. And that evolution that you talk about, I think, is maybe the most important part of the conversation, right? Like it changes over time. It changes week to week sometimes in terms of like what makes a project something that you're excited about pursuing, right? Um, for now, like where we are today, and I don't know where we'll be tomorrow, but it it is this idea of it's as much about the people you're going to do it with as what the idea is right it's yeah. because I, I i think there aren't a ton of new ideas um there are new takes there are new ways in there are new ways to execute it there's the way we would do it versus the way you know somebody else might do it but you know it, it's it becomes a matter of even if the project is a horrible failure even if you don't end up selling the project yes yeah. and you don't even end up making it it still can end up being six months to a year of your life with these people. Then if you end up making a season one, you could add another year to that, right? And then in success, you know, to mention Chef's Table again, I've been making Chef's Table with David Gelb and Brian McGinn for, you know, it feels like much of my adult life at this point. I imagine David, you, you know, you, you're stuck with your collaborators too. And yeah. so it's like, it's, what can we do that's special and unique around this idea? What type of access do we have? What type of characters can we amplify? Because that's the other thing, you know, when you get to a certain point and you do have a bit of a platform and you walk in and you're not just a random person off the street, you're somebody who has a bit of a proven track record, then it's like, what am I using that chip on? Yeah. What, am I, what am I spending that capital on in terms of time, energy, and just opportunity with potential buyers when i try to sell something i always want to feel like i have a secret that i'm about to share um this is my secret i can't wait to tell you about it and once i tell you well now you're in on the secret and we get to we get yeah. to sort of go forward together and so it's what's the secret and who am i keeping the secret with and do i want to keep the secret with them you know over time because life is too short to sort of make things that um don't feel good in the making of them i love that that's that's dead on yeah i love it you know the 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 cool part about our evolution at scout recently is the um the filter or the lens that we look at projects at now um we <clears throat> we for a long time we were using and, and elsa's probably heard me say the same but transformation through information told with comedy that has heart. And um, that transformation is not about a new dress or a new living room or, or all the things, but about transformation kind of inside and out and mental, physical, spiritual evolution and growth 
uh, is something that we really try to look at to, uh, to Andrew, to your point. And what characters can we lift up and what story can we tell? So, you know, for example, Legendary, our, our show set in the ballroom scene and culture on, on HBO Max, that came, and, and I'll, I'll tell you, uh, aside from perhaps having good taste, the one thing that Andrew I really connect with on is like passion, right? It's like that secret. Like if I've gotten that secret and I'm in, my passion is what it's all about because ultimately that's what I'm going to go and sell, right? I'm, I'm selling my passion for something and that, that I'm trying to say to that buyer, like, look, th this is really special. It's really special. This is not just me selling another widget, right? This is something that has something behind it that hopefully can, the trajectory can help do a little change, a little evolution, right? That transformational storytelling. And, and Legendary was one of those moments for us where um, uh, Renato Lombardo and, and Sean came into our office like, hey, you guys want to come to a ball? There's a ball Saturday night in, in WeHo. And I was like, oh, I don't care. Yeah, cool, whatever. So I went on a Saturday night to the West Hollywood Gymnasium, and there must have been 200 young, uh, and when I say young, like, you know, 15 to 25 year old, young African-American, trans, gay, LGBTQIA folks inside of this gymnasium having a blast, showing, doing runway, doing, you know, executive realness, showing all these things. And I got into the elevator with uh, two young, young guys on the way down, and they were giddy with excitement and crying. And I was like, guys, what's up, what's up? And they were like, oh, we just got asked to be in the house of Gucci. And I realized <laughs> in that moment how special this world was and how unique and how important it was that these young kids' stories get told. And so that little creative spark of evolution, we went back to Scout and I was like, oh my God, the ballroom world. And then for me, I got to find out that's been going on since Paris is burning. It had been happening for well over 30 years, this culture that had been hidden and secret. And now we got to open that package up and put them on a pedestal and celebrate the ballroom culture and all of the people who, who make that so special. Because that whole culture is about family and storytelling. Yeah. So anyway, that's a long way around. But the passion behind what that little you know, marginalized community, quite frankly, oh, yeah. you get to tell their story now. And so how do you, Amanda, you know, for, for fortunately, if you have someone that has that level of passion and vision, right, like that's obviously an important starting point. What is your process and like what is your entry point into encapsulating that into what eventually you can sell to a buyer and how do you sort of process that and and manage that? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm such a fan of what David and what Andrew put out into the world. And so it's been really fun for someone with, with my with my background, which is a very, very traditional documentary film sales, docu independent documentary feature background to now get to work alongside producers making shows that I watched for pleasure, like Queer Eye and like Chef's Table. So it's been incredible sort of the blending of these two worlds of um, unscripted television and traditional documentary filmmaking and how People in the community have given a, the opportunity to be on this, the biggest stages with the biggest streamers um, and to make a, some real money on either series or features and to be taken seriously um, amongst um, you know, their narrative colleagues or their more sort of television-based colleagues. I think we've been sort of in the shadows for far too long. So it's been a really great moment and for us, it definitely starts with who is that team of collaborators? Who is the filmmaker? Who is the producer or production company? And putting together absolutely beautiful materials to take out into the world, whether we're deciding to go straight to the streamers and the broadcasters, or if we're thinking of setting it up independently through a slew of independent financiers. Um, and, kind of, and really every project is very bespoke. Some projects need more development. Some projects feel like we need to make it, improve it, and then take it out to sell. Some projects are so commercial and um, 
accessible that we feel like it's better for us to just go straight to the market and sell it and hopefully not have to submit a budget, but people will be clamoring over all of us to tell us how much they want to buy it for. So we work, um, we're a very small team for being at such a large agency and we're very careful about the films and producers and filmmakers that we work with and we're choosy, but we have this incredible group of colleagues in the television department that we work side by side with um, on their television shows, their series, their documentary series and features. And it's been wonderfully collaborative, but it really does start with a great idea and a great thinker and building that team around that person. I kind of, I was taught by a mentor many years ago that um, you want to create a war room. And that thinking, um, that was a really brilliant marketing executive named Mark Schiller who said that. And that thinking has sort of gotten me through every time I sit down and look at a team, like, is this our war room or who do we need to bring in? Whether that's a lawyer, an editor, a manager, a producer. Um, so that's sort of where we always start. So you know, I, yeah, great, I was going to say, I also think about <clears throat> who it's for. And that question, I think, has layers to it, right? There's the obvious of like, who's actually, go well, maybe it's not that obvious, but like, who is the viewer who wants to watch this? We always have this litmus test of, of like, could you do an eighth grade assembly around this show? Could you, when there were assemblies, could you call the whole eighth grade in? Could you put them in the auditorium, make them watch an episode or two of this, and then talk about it afterwards? And if it's worthy of that, then it's then it's worthy of our you know year and a half two years to try to you know make this thing i think similar to what david's saying about transformation i think our formats or topics aren't as explicitly transformational as yours david but there is that sort of question of what are we going to leave the viewer with so who's it for who's the audience and how will they connect to this but then it's like what platform is it for there's not a ton of you know it's not like the the old days um, not to date us all or to age us all, but like, it's not where you have an idea and you make a deck and a sizzle reel and you share it with 30 potential buyers. It's really, everyone's mandates are very specific and just the number of people that you sell to is very specific. And so who is this idea for? And then uh, an extension of the previous conversation uh, that I think everybody has mentioned now, and am I going to get to make it with that person? Am I, you know, would it be exciting that particular executive at Netflix or that particular executive at HBO Max or that particular team who's going to be out in the field or, you know, whatever it is, that all becomes part of the alchemy yes. and the magic alchemy yeah. of what makes these things successful. And it starts with, as Amanda said, agent, lawyer, accountant, whatever, whoever else is in your war room. And then it extends all the way to the people you'll be making it with at the network, the people you'll be making it with internally, and the talent that you'll be making it with, who you'll be making it with um, in the field. I do find that relationships have become more essential than ever within the buying community, really understanding each individual, because they're not that many, you're right. So of the 15 to 20 people, who are who's the right person? What do they like? What are they gravitating towards? Because across the board, we found that these executives just like how agents like to operate as producers and producers, of course, are producers. They want to be the producer. They want to be, have a creative point of view and put their creative stamp and spin and, and be exceptionally involved throughout production and, and give notes. And so to empower the, that specific buyer with a project that we feel like is for them and we're really excited to bring yeah. it to them, I think has been um, a, a, a very effective way of getting projects out into the world. And so what happens for us to all be vulnerable for a second, right? Like best laid plans, right? Or do you have specific examples or specific lessons of either your, as Fried always says to me, his spidey senses tell him that like something is just not working as planned or, or is there a specific experience that you can think to that like you thought for sure this was it and, and in execution, whether in development sale or execution right it just fell flat that you can speak to and how you what you've learned from that sort of I, I will... way too many times is the sad part there are things and this is this is vulnerable and 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 honest right there are projects that you just sort of it's a very human thing 
right? You meet someone, David Collins walks into my office one day and he's got an idea and he's electric and he's excited and I'm excited and and maybe it, it clouds the, the fact that the idea is, eh, eh. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, yeah. there was something magical in the room and it was all exciting. Sometimes I think what I've learned is to be honest with ourselves about those things so that you're not stuck. Because the nightmare scenario of that is that, okay, you do the legal deal and that takes a while. And then you get the creative materials going. And by the time you take it out to market, you're not really all that excited about it anymore. And and people can feel that. That the I have a secret and I'm excited to share it with you. And this one's really, really special. Yeah. Doesn't work if you're just sort of fine over with it. it. Yeah. If you're over it. Exactly. And so I recently, you know, internally at Boardwalk, we we had this project that we were all so excited about. And then as we were getting ready to take it out, it just lost that luster. And so we said, what was exciting about this to us when we started? Because I think we've lost that. And let's rework the materials if we have to. And let's 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 be honest with ourselves, but we have to sort of tap back into that initial inception moment of like what thrilled us in a very human way. We are all viewers. We all go home at some point and after dinner with our roommate, partner, husband, wife, child, parent, whoever we live with, we like turn on the TV and watch something. What makes us want to watch? And if we have forgotten that as we're about to walk in to the office to pitch it, then it it is our responsibility to like huddle up and say, okay, we've lost something here. Let's take the moment, let's be deliberate and let's re-tap into that juice. Andy, I'm... that's so dead on. Go ahead, sorry, Amanda, go no, ahead. No, 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 please. No, no, I was just gonna say that that's, you know, if that passion wanes over the development process, you are in trouble, you know? Um, I, I, Amanda, you know, I'll come back to you one day. I just wanna say that we have started something just this year where Eric Korsh, our president, be careful who you hire as a president, by the way, because they're, you know, you think you may own the company, but dear Lord, they come in and, you know, and, and I love it because he's the guy that's very logical. Like, yeah. So you have 17 things over here on your on your list of to do's. Which ones of those do you really believe in? Which ones of those do you really feel that passion for? And I love it that he stops me is like, you can't have them all. <laughs> they all can't be your favorites. And that is such a smart, like, pause moment because, Andrew, you're right. That development process, I'll really age us. Back in the day when you used to sell off a of paper and an idea <laughs> without a sizzle reel. How about that for crazy, right? Like, people had producers these days are like, you did what? Yeah, I had an idea. And I went and I called the buyer. And I was like, hey, I have a really cool idea. Uh, uh, the fun little tidbit, uh, ABC Family, right after Queer Eye. Queer Eye was happening, and that Queer Eye sale is a crazy story. But ABC Family, I had uh, young nieces. I hadn't had kids yet. I have 12, my, it's my girl's 12th birthday today. Oh, happy and, birthday. But they, uh, my nieces were, were becoming tweens. And I was like, their rooms were like, they need, they had little Winnie the Pooh wallpaper and they wanted to change their room into like rock and roll teenage rooms. And I called the, I called up ABC family. I called up, it was uh, Mina LeFemme who runs Facebook now. And, and I was like, Mina, so listen, I have this idea, like, I don't know, like knock first where kids have to put a sign on the door and their parents, and it was long story short, on one phone call, one meeting, without even a piece of paper, like, yeah, let's do it. And we, we, and she said, we're gonna strip it. And I remember being so young and even strip it. Oh my God, we have to get dressed. What's happening? A strip, a strip <laughs> show? I had no idea what a strip show was. And we ended up making 180 of them, almost 200 of them as a strip show back in the day. I went off topic, I apologize. No, this is the topic. <laughs> Oh, so, I mean, I think you, you, all I was going to say is that sometimes the easier project, the set, the projects that seem the easiest are end up being the hardest. Mm. And I think it's always important so true. from filmmakers who are at the top of their game to first timers to put in the work and make a tape or really focus on a, a very clear and thoughtful deck 
Um, even if it's a mood reel, like pushing the clients to create materials and really think deeper about the topic is essential in the sales process right now because the market is so crowded and crazy. Yeah. Um, so that's really been, I think, important is that we're sometimes shocked by the products that don't sell because we weren't, we were so cocky about going into the market in the first place. Um, <laughs> And sometimes the ones that are the most unique and, and kind of highest conceptually are the ones that make the biggest impact. Um, I think, yeah. And also, and by I, the way, I, now I'm so thrilled that HBO Max has really stepped up and been an incredible home for queer content, because I think for a lot of times, there have not been that many big streaming platforms that can provide some incredible, incredible shows. and. We went out with the project recently, or I guess two years ago, before Max started, on the Queer Bible, which is this incredible um, online magazine. And I remember everyone told us, "Oh, we have our, we have our queer show," or, or we have, or it's, you know, we don't. And and us all looking at each other, like the materials were great, the team was great, it was super blue chip. And now, I mean, hopefully, we'll see what happens. But I do think that with Max in the really making an effort to put out more queer content that will just be bode well for so many incredible projects. Mm, for sure. Sorry, that was a tangent. No, 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 for sure. No, it's all about the tangent. We, we love to, we're, we kind of always fight this idea of like, oh, you're the queer eye guy, right? And, and, and while our company is run by, you know, 85% gay men, it, we're not a gay company where we consider ourselves very omnicultural, right? Like for us, it's exciting to push those doors and open those doors up. Michael, my my uh, business partner and co-founder, Michael Williams and I, we grew up in, in, in the uh, world of, of, of scripted, huge studio features, right? And and then when the company started, um, we got introduced, because we were in Boston, Scout started in Boston, to this crazy little filmmaker named Errol Morris. And Errol and Michael and I, got hung out and got some coffee and what happened was a seven year uh doctorate education in on um, in, in, in documentary filmmaking because i and michael had only known 120 page script you break the script down you're budgeting you know you're doing the whole thing and he's like i don't know how to script I got a bucket full of crazy people over here. You want to meet them? And that's where our world came. And so I feel like what a mentor we got in Errol to teach us and let us really behind his curtain, but then just sit with him for seven years and absorb his, his genius it is really how, how it works. He works like a mad genius. And, uh, and he does it by listening and, and talking and having these conversations where the script just writes itself magically. Um, and we're still, to this day, I'm so fortunate to have uh, produced her. And my very first TV series was a, a show called First Person that um, uh, nice. we didn't have two nickels to run together. And I went and got money from Channel 4 and the BBC. And then I, it's how I met Francis Barrick at IFC. Uh, it was Sundance Channel and IFC and Trio under the rainbow media umbrella and uh and thank goodness i met francis because it was francis who i then ended up calling saying i have this show called queer eye these five gay oh guys gosh. they come and help yeah. and she laughed her ass off on the other end of the call she's like what i'm like yeah anyways that's the truth of that matter so i guess kind of looking at the you know, the seats that you guys are all sitting in, right? You're sort of at the forefront and leading, sort of creating the content that we're all watching in the unscripted space. So there's a couple sort of like external factors I wanna talk about today. The first, I'm, I'm kind of flipping the order of what we pre-programmed, but the first is sort of the world around us culturally and from a from a BLM cancel culture sort of, it, it, there's just so much going on and so much sensitivity and, and change. I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm coming from an optimistic point of view. And so as you enter the world like legendary or even as you enter traditional world, how are you um, mindful of being, uh, you know, start reverse engineering and starting with the audience that Andrew speaks of who is watching this and how do you involve those that are watching that in the creative process and how do you, 
sort of reconcile and deal with making sure there's authenticity in the story making with either the, from the team standpoint or the approach standpoint, um, because I know you guys are in such intimate worlds and spaces. Yeah, I, I think that um, your Errol Morris tutelage is probably the masterclass in this, right? It's it's about finding people. It, 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 I, I hate to oversimplify it, but like Errol Morris can put somebody in front of a white psych and put one camera just, you know, with their face center frame and make something that, you know, when I saw Fog of War the first time, I literally, as soon as it ended, I watched it again. Mm. It's the only movie um, that I can think of that, like, as soon as it was over, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa I, I need to see that whole thing right wow. immediately. But it's that kind of thing, right? Where that was just that was just a person in front of a white site for 90 minutes or however long it was. <laughs> and so um, I think that we are trying very specifically, and I think we've always done this. Again, I go back to that word amplification, to amplify stories and to tell stories that are real and authentic and hopefully connect with people. Not to tell them how they're supposed to connect. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, different people from different places are gonna connect to stories in very, very different ways. But we have a platform to sort of amplify, whether it's Ladarius on Cheer, or whether it's, you know, characters on Last Chance You, or Christina Tosi on Chef's Table. Like, it's, it, 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 it's just somebody who we want to offer that platform to, to speak vulnerably and honestly and, and sort of share their superpowers with the world. I think what we're trying not to do is tell COVID stories or BLM stories or, you know, headline politic driven social movement stories. There is social change in all of the stories that we're telling. If it's a barbecue chef in, in Austin, Texas, there is social change that is encompassed in that story. And I think we have a responsibility now to make sure we always had this responsibility, but for me, it, it feels uh, all the more pressing to also tell those stories with from a collection of voices of people who lend authenticity to that and make the stories more genuine and more interesting for the viewer. But again, and I, I don't know if everybody agrees with this, but we're we live, I'll digress for a second. We live in this sort of interesting space at Boardwalk Pictures where we are an entertainment first company and that we focus primarily on TV series. We also do feature films as well, but primarily on TV series, but they're documentary. It's it's like from Amanda's, it, it's like I sort of stand maybe at right between where Amanda was talking about in sort of like documentary feature film world and maybe where David, you know, comes from more, you know, formatted reality stuff where he gets to make 180 episodes of something. We don't really get to do that. Um, but we're entertainment first. We're trying to entertain people. We're not trying to hit people over the head with something that they also can see on CNN, MSNBC or whatever news channel they watch. So we're trying to allow people to escape. We're trying to entertain first. We're trying to give people something that they connect to emotionally um, without it being the sole mission of the thing that we're putting out into the world, if that makes sense. Yeah. And David, how are you? I mean, I know with your shows, there's, there's such intimate sort of, to your point, marginalized words oftentimes, and you, you guys are really, I, I just know in the scout creative process, you guys are so conscious of that and being open and inclusive. Um, so how, how do you sort of approach that and deal with that from a company standpoint? Sure, sure. You know, it's interesting. We we were doing a little bit of uh, analysis from last year of like who comes to us versus what we develop in house uh, partnerships and, and relationships. And I, I'd say it's it's fun that our our filter uh, has, is really pretty broad, right? So we get to make formatted shows and follow docs and, 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 and doc features and doc series. Our, our doc divisions is really having a lot of fun right now with some really great products. And I apologize. I didn't mean to do that to, no, to you. No, no, I, no, no, by no means. I look, my, our, our main, our main business is definitely, you know, selling in the, in that lane of, of series. Um, and, 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 for the longest time, this is a kind of old story that'll connect back. 
there was this window between the original Queer Eye and the reboot, right? Where every single room I went into with whatever I was selling, the buyer would say, oh, boy, really wish we could have our Queer Eye. Yeah, well, God, you know, do you, do you have another, yeah, Queer Eye? Yeah, can you make a Queer Eye for us? And by the way, these were all the terrestrial buyers, right? We we won't name names. All the cablers and, and everyone in that in that world, they wanted the queer eye. And then one day the rights reverted back a queer eye. And I went into each one of them and I was like, hey, guess what? Not only can you have a queer eye, you can have queer eye. And they were all like, mm, wow, that's great, but it's so associated with this or that. The marketplace has changed completely now, right? We know that, the, the evolution of media and where we are, the streamers. And we are uh, really fortunate to be creating and developing for the, you know, we have a, an amazing new show with Disney Plus that's shooting up in Napa Valley right now, which is this fun, immersive reality show. Uh, an amazing relationship with HBO Max and Netflix and Amazon all of them, but they all have a little bit of a different vertical and spin on that creative take and what it is they want too earnest, more a little more salacious and fun. And so for us internally, we do keep that filter, right? That, that scalification, we call it. What is our special sauce? Andrew, to your point, what's our secret? What are we adding to the, to the special sauce that makes it work? So when things come in from outside, we're pretty quick to say like, oh, cool. That's like a core concept for a format. Now can we scoutify it? Can we make it ours? Can we figure out how to make it special? Um, you had asked, you know, things that failed. We had a partnership, some of the biggest, like big names all together. And the show was celebrity driven and it was heartfelt and it felt so scout. It didn't sell. You know, after all the work and time and effort. So it's it's one of those things where the 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 passion, it, it's timing, right? You got timing, the idea's right, your war room's right, everything has to kind of come together and make it and make it go out into the marketplace at, at the right time. Um I don't know. The doc world you're, versus the format world's very different for us. But your your scoutifying conversation is one that I think we also have in terms of what makes this a boardwalk project, but but it's one that I would encourage any creative person to have, whether they have the platform that you and I are fortunate enough to have or not. Like, it's look, I, I tell this story all the time. I never would have imagined that a you know documentary series. We, we were we were always saying we do documentary television, right? And people would tell us there's no such thing. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, when, when we first shared the chef's table deck that was then called Chef Story, as uh, as Elsa very well knows. Um, but like when we shared that deck with agents and partners and people around town, everybody just said before that's not a TV time. show before Amanda's time. But <laughs> but everybody said that's not a TV show, you know, and 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 maybe it wasn't. But um, we certainly had our take on what that would be and how to do it. And then we went through that period of, oh, what we really want is chef's table. What we really want is chef's, you know, do you have, can we do chef's table of surfers? Can we do chef's table of, you know, auto mechanics? Like, and, 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 and everybody wanted that. All to say that I never could have imagined for all of the preaching of there is documentary television and there is such a thing as documentaries and people will engage and then Netflix happened and the world changed. But I never could have imagined that my life would change over a show about cheerleading. Like, that is not a passion of mine. Like, thank God Greg Whiteley called one day and said, I think I got my next thing. Um, but I think what made it distinctly Greg Whiteley's and what made it distinctly Boardwalk is all in the execution. Yeah. 50 production companies could have gone to Corsicana, Texas and met the Navarro College cheerleading team. And I suspect that most of them would have come back with some generic version of a show that would be a show called Texas Cheer and the interviews would be in front of green screen and they'd all be like very present tense of like, oh my gosh, I'm really nervous. Like whatever it would be. <laughs> but the idea that Greg and his team and, you know, with our support, luckily, um, 
did something that was sort of so authentic and real and, and documentary in its approach is what made it special. We didn't invent cheerleading. We're not the first person people yeah. to do a cheerleading show. And, you know, there will be others after. We're certainly not the first people to do a show about chefs either. We just did like hour long art films about chefs with, you know, again, pasta set to classical music. But like, I think it, people are always coming to me and saying, what do I do with my idea? And I don't want to share it. And here are 16 NDAs to sign because I don't want you to, you know, steal the idea or whatever it is. Yeah. It's like, if it can be stolen, it's not yours. Like, what is your take? What is the access? What is the unique thing? Because again, anybody could have done a show about cheerleading. Anybody could have done a show about people who cook. Anybody could have done a show about any number of things that we profiled, but we did it our way. And, and, and I encourage everybody, even if you're just new to town, what about it is special to you and yeah. then it's yours and nobody can take it from you. It's brilliant, Andrew. I, I will, I, I, you know, you, you have set the gold standard with chef's table, right? In that a lot of people use that. And, oh, I have the chef's table for this and that. And, and we have the same thing with queer eye. Oh, well, I have this like queer eye take on this and that. And we always say the same thing you do internally, which is, you know what? Anybody can make a show in that arena about that, but what's ours? Like what makes it, what makes it special and scout? We're out with a show right now with Cam Newton. I can say that because we're out with it. Yeah, we are. Um, and it, it's one of those in a million years, I'm like, oh, it's so queer eye-ish, right? But it's really fun. It's suiting up with Cam Newton. And it's basically like queer eye for athletes, pro athletes. It works. It's fun. It's cool. It's got a big heart, the whole thing. And someone brought that, you know, Cam said, you guys do the queer eye. I want to do it with you. So there's the fit, right? That's how that works. Yeah. So to that point, Amanda, like I, I think Freed and Andrew, Freed and David are, are tapping into something that I've sort of experienced from the outside looking in over the past few years, which is there's sort of a the queer eye chef's table guy, but there's also this to their point, it's really like the production company's execution and and have our buyers sophisticated now enough to appreciate sort of the production company execution of it versus sort of a copycat show like how are by like and and is that by the way are some buyers more evolved than others in that sort of approach um give us the tea share it yeah Come on. the buyers are wonderful and i love that <laughs> <laughs> and i will never say anything negative ever oh. um i'm just kidding um i know who you are no i'm just kidding you, <laughs> there, know you are buyer so I I do think that there is a a real desire across the board to find the independent documentary filmmaker to be the sort of star of the show, whether it's Greg Whiteley or David Gelb or Marina Zenovich or Dan Lindsay and TJ Martin. Like there are these sort of name tentpole people that are really, really work in the market. Um, who everyone sort of is clamoring to be in business with. And at least that's uh, for uh, for my for my group, like that's a sweet spot for us. We really focus on director driven projects, whether it's a series, a two parter, a four parter, or if they have the occasional longer formatted show. So I think the collaboration between the production company and the director is essential if the director is deciding to go work with a more traditional production company. And the ones that we feel have really risen to the top are those that listen, that those that understand that like this is also an opportunity for them to make money. So they're very, you know, it's a fair budgeting making experience and it's not just sort of this proprietary, this is our budget and we'll, we'll make a deal with you when we can. Like it's a very, it's a collaboration, it feels, healthy from day one. Um, and it feels like there's real added value. I think when it goes south, um, to be to give you the honest truth, is when the production company feels ownership over a show and they do nothing because they're busy dealing with their 20 other projects. And our directors get very frustrated because they know they're doing all the work and sometimes they're editing the series or the features and they're, um, they have no support and they're not making the same amount of money that these production companies are making. And instead of the networks trusting the filmmakers to be able to deliver and um, 
on schedule, on budget, they're putting the trust in these production companies that really don't understand documentary filmmaking, but are more in the business of reality television that are now given the opportunity because they have a lot of infrastructure and a lot of background and backing by the streamers. I think that sort of wave has begun to shift because so many of our director clients and not only our agency, but other agencies are launching their own production companies. And I think that a lot of the networks are seeing that there has been this form of, I mean, abuse is a too strong of a word, but there has been this form of, um, of, of challenge, challenge relationships between larger established production companies and filmmakers. And the buyers do want to protect their filmmaking relation, filmmaker relationships first and foremost, because they, this is, they are the talent. Um, they are the reason that projects get awards. They're the, they are the sort of shining stars of the documentary community. And I think that the filmmakers that, you know, have had really wonderful relationships with production companies, those companies are immediately at the forefront of everyone's mind because the community is so small. So everyone talks and everyone knows who's good to work with, who's bad to work with, who's who's a helpful creative, who's not, who will share in a co-production line fee, who, who who's collaborative, all of those things. So it's not always financial, but sometimes it is. And I think that as long as we continue to sort of have this be a really copacetic, wonderful relationship between the production companies and the and the filmmakers, it'll only help the actual work. Um, because whenever you sort of know that there's weird stuff going on behind the camera, it shows up in the work. When um, I was a showrunner. Sorry, I, yeah. I don't know if that was the answer to your question. No, it I, no. No, that's, it's really helpful. Really? What, I was just going to say that, like, Look, I, I, I interviewed Howard Schultz back in the day for a show called Iconoclast that we did, you know, that yeah. I produced years ago. Um, and talk about documentary filmmakers, wow. you know, to learn from Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sanofsky were you yeah. know, such mentors of me there then. Um, but Howard Schultz said, you know, we just wanted to build a company that I wanted to work at. Um, as he was talking about the founding of Starbucks, you know, it's like you, you get to build the place that you want to be every day. Mm -hmm. um, so that really has extended to like the most basic level of relationship building with people as we, you know, as, as we've grown our company and invited new people in. It's, it's what we, I think, end up running into a lot are something related to what Amanda's saying, which is filmmakers who have maybe fully been able to execute a documentary feature or something on one scale. And now all of a sudden we've sold in a multi-episodic thing that has a different budget, a different delivery. I mean, I remember the day I told David Gelb that we were going to do six chef's table episodes and, you know, we were going to shoot nine days and have eight edit weeks for each episode. And he had made, you know, Jiro dreams of sushi out in the field in a in a far scrappier kind of way, but it I think it was like a over a year long process of how he had made that film independently, and so the methodology becomes something that we take real ownership of, not the creative, the the way to support the creative storyteller and set them up for their best success becomes something that we take great pride in. The other thing that a producer named Michael Hilliard taught me years ago when I was just getting started in the business was, he said, you know, the higher up the sort of call sheet you get, the more you work for everyone or the more people you work for. So as the executive producer of something, I work for everyone. Yeah. And it is my job to give everyone what they need to be the best at what they do, to set them up for success. It seems simple, but when that is your very human approach to a shoot day or an edit day or a two-year process on a show and knowing I work for that person. I work for the director. I work for the editor. I work for the assistant editor. And if I've given the assistant editor more footage than he or she knows what to do with, and now she's here for, you know, 18 hours in a row because like, then I have not job, done my job in working for her. She needs more support. She needs another assistant editor. She needs less footage. She needs more time, whatever it is. And so that's that thing that I think Amanda's talking about that we take great pride in, like David Gelb and Greg Whiteley and Michael John Warren and, and, and Nadia Hallgren and, and, and any of the you know, filmmakers that we work with. It's just, what can I do 
to take real pride and ownership and methodology and create and creative input and amplification and protecting from a legal standpoint and a process standpoint so that you genius filmmaker can do what you do. Amanda, your topic of what you just said honestly could be a whole nother panel because I, I else is it all right. I, I'd love to ask Amanda a question, which is like, Please. you, you were so clear of something that's happening for us, right? The way that we came from Errol Morris. So very old school documentary director first scenario, right? We are there to support Errol's vision and carry it. There's now this showrunner application happening to doc series and filmmaking where, oh, we can do it cheaper and faster with a showrunner in place, which is what we do to make television, right? Have you found that to be where the battle is? Is that what you're saying yeah. is the production company issue? I I don't work with that many. I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not in the weeds on many uh, formatted shows, but for the documentary series portion, we find that there are production companies that are really filmmaker friendly, that get it, that understand what it's like to work with with filmmakers right. versus just a hired gun, a hired DP, or a hired a a And that nuance of patience and cooperation and collaboration has, has, I think, weeded out production companies from the premium streamers because they find that they're not collaborative with the talent. Um, the, the reason I brought up my the reason I brought up the Howard Schultz story before now I remember was that you know build a company that you want to work at. When I was a showrunner before we started Boardwalk, there were times that I would get hired to do a show and they would hand me a budget that was redacted. Exactly. That they would say, they would say oh, this, is, happens. this is your mini budget. They would call exactly. it this is your mini budget, and I would say, look, I worked in a sneaker store in high school. If you're paying $150 for a pair of sneakers, I better bring out a $150 pair of sneakers. I need to know what you're paying for it. If you're buying a half a million dollar show and I have $200,000 to play with, well, then I can't deliver at the expectation of what the buyer was at. And so that was such a disrespectful vibe for me to literally hand me a budget with black lines through it that I just promised I would never do that to anyone. And so I think that's that speaks to our success with all of these different personalities of like, I'm never going to tell you, you don't have visibility into that line. It's your fucking chances show. Are, chances are the director isn't going to try to like call their agent or lawyer and be like, this person's making this much. Like, yeah. that's not the point. The point no. is to make the work and to feel like I'm actually, I'm not just a hired gun to do it. Yeah. And sometimes you're a hired gun, but most of the time you're not like, this is really like all of everyone's in it together. We're also, I would say, for the same reason, we never really got into like the equipment business. I shot a show once, again, as a showrunner, and the DP and I did like a week of camera tests. And we were like, this is the new camera we want to shoot on, and it'll be perfect for this show for all of these reasons. And the production company was like, uh, yeah, these are the cameras we own, and this is what you're going to be shooting on. And it was just like, I never want to do that to someone. Yeah. We don't even own a light. You know what I mean? Like. You 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 figure out with your DP what tools you want and and we'll sort of figure it out down the road. And it probably hurts our bottom line, but in oh, the long, it's long run. Group. It does, because we don't do it either. So. But in the long, long run, it's a longer game than that. And so our it's bottom line- It's a reputational line, investment, absolutely. Yeah. And that's our, the difference between my experience with these two companies and other unscripted shows we work on, which I will say nameless, that usually do one series and then they disappear into the woods because it, you can be a, a what a penny wise and pound foolish and yeah. those things like it's top down right it's a philosophy of like we are yeah. being collaborative we're making something you need to have the taste to david's point you need to have the grace that that andrew has and i think there's a little bit of intuitiveness about being from the top down you know you have to feel when things don't feel right and address it and not from a position of power just turn your nose. And I, I think that those are things that I experience with everyone on this call that helps us get through that process with buyers in a way where it's a successful endeavor. Because it, when it's not, it sucks, as we all know. That's the truth. And I yeah. think that the newer people that are watching this, because I'm sure there are a lot of fresh faces watching it, you know, it's, it's really good to, it's okay to sort of ask around about the person you're getting into bed with, you know, or business with, probably the right phrase. Like, I think asking 
producers, directors, editors, just make sure you do your homework because it is a relationship that will be for a year, hopefully repeated if it's a returnable series. And you just really want to know who those the team is and not yeah. sometimes the people like David and Andrew can be misleading because they're wonderful and charming and brilliant, but you're not really working with them all the time. There's who are their people who are, who's going to be your person at that company. That's the connective tissue. And I think it's really essential to ask all of those questions. And that alchemy is what it's all about. Like, honestly, if I like Elsa and I've spoken about this, like, I don't know why often why we've had the success that we've had. And when people are like, what makes you spend whatever that question is, it's like, I think I'm a good matchmaker. I think that like, I look at these projects and I put groups of people together to execute them that don't make sense all the time. But yeah, that's what I feel like my magic is. I used to think that I was like a filmmaker or an interviewer or all of these things, but like, I'm a Yenta. I can a make- Yenta. I was about to say that, 100%. Oh, all Yenta. Yenta. I'm real that we're all Yentas. Oh, we're all Yentas. I love it. So on that note, we're going to, we're going to end it. I, you know, I didn't even go down the rabbit hole that is COVID because honestly, like I'm so sick of that conversation, but uh, just to end it kind of in, in what you experienced last year with the shutdown, because it impacted all of us in so many ways. And, and what, how are you looking at this year from your point of view and what would be your advice to everybody watching this, wanting to be in this world and space and making this kind of thing in terms of your approach to 2021 in this sort of like pandemic after the fact state? I'm going to quickly repeat myself and then turn it over to somebody to say something new. But I, I think for us, we're trying to not just tell a COVID story. They, they will be told and we will watch them but for us, we're trying to find interesting worlds, interesting people. Everybody is, look, for the last five, six years, we've been telling stories that take place in restaurants and sporting events and some other places, but like restaurants and sporting events are big for us. So of course, COVID is a character in all of these shows, old and new, but we're just trying to not tell COVID stories, but let COVID be a character through the larger story that you're telling. Um, that's that's sort of my best advice. It, please. No, I, I was just say uh, we all are so tired, right? We're like, please, COVID, go away. <laughs> um, I will tell you this much. We've learned a lot. The COVID has opened up. There are things that will be changed forever. Post-production, in my opinion, is changed forever. When, forever. And, and this is a, a, a really great full circle, quick COVID story. COVID on March uh, 11th, we were shooting the season finale of Legendary Season 1 in Stanford, Connecticut. I was there. Most of the scout team was there. And it was like you watched the tsunami wave, tidal wave of COVID coming, right? And New York City closed down and then the border closed and all this. And we're a show based on an audience, a massive audience celebrating this community. And I remember standing at 5 a.m. in the morning on the stage on the morning of the finale and all of us having to look at each other and be like, are we really not having an audience on the finale? Long story short, we didn't. And that episode, when you watch it, there's this news slurry of crazy that explains that COVID came and we had to make a decision as producers. Fingers crossed, we are shooting episode two tomorrow of season two. And as the arc goes, my biggest hope is that the season finale, where we have no audience, by the way, none for this season. But season finale, season two, I want an audience. I want to push through. I want to show, look, we've made it. The year, beginning and end, right? We ended without an audience, and we're going to end this one with an audience. Uh, because ultimately, all of our creative has been impacted. The storytelling, no one wants to watch masks. No one wants to feel it because is entertainment and escapism, right? We also, the creative's gotten smushed on so many projects in a way that is defeating. It's, it's, it hurts, right? And you're like, oh, that's not what it's supposed to be. But our creative 
and Hotspot kicks in, and we're like, all right, but we can do it. And here's how we're going to do it. And the I will say this much: the bond between buyer and production company and producers and crew and and that world has has really grown immense in, during this time because we needed each other. We had to learn how to figure this out together from the buyer's point of view and the the, the producer and filmmaker's point of view. So there's some pluses there, um, but that's that's uh, that is where we are. I before, love it. It's hopeful. That's perfect. Before I let Amanda, I hope the same for our theaters. That sounds great. Right. But but you are right. I think post production has changed forever, and forever. I think that. And I think that that's an interesting thing to note. And that hive of like being, you know, we're going to wax poetic someday about like being in the edit room at <laughs> two o'clock in the morning wow. and, yeah. and all this stuff. And like, I don't know when that happens again. I don't know when we're sitting in a 10 by 10 room with six people, you know, cranking on a cranking on a rough cut again. But the good old days. The good old days. Amanda, sorry, I cut you off. You were saying something smart. No, that was perfect. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you guys. Um, I've learned even just so much in the past 55 minutes. Uh, we're, we're over, but um, I really appreciate everyone on this panel, and I hope you all have learned something. Um, I know I do every day working with these guys, so thanks so much for joining, and hopefully next year we'll all be in an audience with Queso hey. and Cowboy Hats. Okay? Thanks, awesome. guys. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, Andrew. Bye-bye.